used right away to extend parallelized number of algorithms. And a lot of those are actually from the more system systems world. And so part of this uh, talk is a bit of a tutorial to you know, show you some basic tricks that you can use as pretty much, you know, certain questions that you can apply to large set of algorithms. And then I'll give you one, maybe two examples of how you can actually make that work directly for specific algorithms. Um, so first of all, thanks to those five guys who contributed to that. Uh, Sergei the most. Uh, that's why he's in the middle. Um, and like with Joey and Marcus had very inspiring discussions. Um, so let's talk a little bit about okay the, thing, uh, the agenda of this. So I'll first explain a little bit various distribution and load balancing algorithms. So those of you who've taken a systems class, some of this may look very, very straightforward. Um, those of you who haven't, it may look actually quite uh, surprising what you can do. So I'll talk a little bit about consistent hashing, distributed hash tables, and so on. Maybe in the end, if we have time, I'll get to peer-to-peer -to -peer networks, but probably we won't have time. And then I'll show you one application in detail, namely data sketches, how you can actually turn data sketches into something that is then uh, both uh, scalable, fault-tolerant, and also uh, deals with temporal variability in the data. And that's actually three attributes that you usually don't find in conjunction with the uh, run-of-the-mill data sketch algorithms. And I'll then probably quickly show you one or two slides how the very same ideas can be used to distribute graphical models. And if you want to know more about the latter, you should probably go to the non parametric based talk uh, workshop in the afternoon, but don't run away yet. So, distribution strategies. So, well, let's just look a little bit at what we would want. So, one thing that we would want is we want to have, you know, a variable and the load distribution. So, in other words, uh, the objects need to be distributed over possibly a large pool of machines. And, well, those machines can be faulty. And then the data needs to go across various numbers of machines. The com computation load needs to be distributed. And one way of actually achieving that is quite nicely done by what's called consistent hashing. And I'll show you that in a moment. So um, especially you can actually find entirely uniform distributions, but you could also have machines with different capabilities. You know, some maybe have twice as fast a processor or a larger disk. And you might actually send more data to them. So this is what's called proportional hashing. And I'll probably skip over the overlay networks entirely. Uh, before going into details, let's briefly talk about hash functions. So a hash function is essentially a computational device to fake a random number. I mean, yes, we use random number generators anyway, but I'm willing to go actually more extreme to say, well, you know, rather than invoking your random number generator, you should probably stuff a hash function with a parameter such that you can just recall that random number at any time. So um, the goal why you might want to do that is because maybe you want to reevaluate that random number if you want to, for instance, randomly assign items to machines at a later time. So the naive thing would be, well, you know, for each new key that we see, we compute a random number. We store it in a big lookup table. And it's, you know, as random as my random number generator can be. But it uses a ridiculous amount of memory because I now need to increase that table as I insert more items. And it gets slower as we do more of that. And I can't really merge it well between computers. That's a big deal. So basically, if I want to synchronize random number generators between different machines, it's a pain. Because yes, you could basically start them with the same seed. But then, oh my god, if you call if some part of your code calls a random number generator more than the other part, you're screwed. So you can't really go back. So a better idea is to use, well, a essentially a random number generator with a seed, and you just then invoke it each time. So the good thing is you don't really need any memory for that because you just, you know, use your key as the seed, and then you just, you know, pull one random number out. And now you can actually merge things between machines, which is really handy. And, well, now the speed of this operation, of course, is independent of how many times I've invoked it. Um, there's a lot more beautiful theory and uh, analysis for that, so I very much recommend that you actually have a look at this paper here by Uli Maurer. So he talks about, a lot about cryptography, pseudo-random permutation generators, and so on. It's a very beautiful 
treatment of you know what various types of independence mean. In practice, use something like murmur hash. So murmur hash version three is actually very very fast. I think it processes in the maybe four or five gigabytes per second per core. If you want to do something very cheaply, this is probably good enough. So this is like a fast linear congruential generator. Based, in other words, you take your key, multiply it by an integer, add another integer to it, more the third integer, and those coefficients a, b, and c, you can look them up on Wikipedia. And there's probably about 10 different sets, and you pick the one that you like. So why all this introduction about hash functions? Well, the first thing I want to show you is the argmin hash. This is probably one of the older ones. I could trace it back at least to Cargus 99 paper, but it's probably older than that. So the idea is I have a set of keys, and I want to uniformly distribute them over a machine pool. And I want to have that fully determined by a hash function. So what I do is I take, well, the, is um, that pointer? Yeah. So I basically take the hash of the key and the machine ID. So for each machine in my machine pool, I do that. And then I pick the machine with the smallest hash value. OK. Now, this procedure will, as you can easily see, give me a uniform distribution of keys over machines. The nice thing about it is that if a machine dies, then, well, for all the keys for which this machine wasn't <coughs> the smallest one, nothing happens. So nothing gets reassigned. Furthermore, for those machines, for which the key actually, well, that, that machine what had the smallest hash entry, this machine, well, the next machine is going to be ra uniformly random again. So in other words, only a fraction of 1 over n, if I have n machines, only a fra fraction of 1 over n of the data gets randomly assigned uniformly over the other n machines. That's quite convenient. Because it basically means that if I have a failure, my load balancing is going to spread across my entire set of machines. Likewise, if I need to add additional resources, again, only a very small fraction of keys will be reassigned, and it'll pull them uniformly from all the other machines. It's kind of cute. You can do a little bit better than that if you want to have replications. So for instance, if I want to have a distributed file system with lots of replications and not a single master, then what I could do is I could, could just you know, take the k smallest guys rather than the smallest guy. And again, the same properties hold. And there's actually a beautiful file system which does this. It's, it's called Ceph, C-E-P-H. And it's a very nice distributed replicated file system. And they do a lot of other clever tricks in it. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, look it through. Um, there's one big downside to this, as you can immediately see. That's OK if your machine pool is you know, a couple of dozen, maybe 100 machines. But from there on, it gets really messy because I mean, you need to compute this hash for each single machine. That can be very, very expensive. <coughs> so can we fix that? Well, the one way to fix it is what's called a distributed hash table. So for instance, Cassandra uses a, well, slightly hacky version of that. So basically what you do is you take your machines and you have, well, for each machine ID, well, let's take the IP number, I compute the hash, and I put them onto the ring of n keys. So it's the mathematical ring of n keys. And now what I do is, for each item that comes along, I go and hash it, and I then assign it to, well, in this case, the, well, rightmost <coughs> machine to that key. If a new item comes along, you know, assign it to this machine, and so on. Now, if you do that, you're obviously very fast, because you have a logarithmic time lookup in the number of machines. But the problem is that, as you can easily see, those distances here can actually vary quite a bit. Uh, the good thing is, I'll, as I'll show you in a moment, that variation can be made reasonably small, but you have a lot more variation. The other downside is, if I lose a machine here, then immediately, well, this machine here will get all the keys from that one. So I have significant load imbalance if, as I insert or remove a machine, and furthermore, if, uh, well, the overall blocks are quite large too. So let's see how we can actually fix that a little bit. <coughs> let's first do a little bit of analysis. So as you can 
reasonably straightforwardly see it, you can always define the machine that you're interested in as being at position zero. So then the probability for the, that segment to the right hand side being larger than c, b, being larger than c is basically just one minus c to the m minus one, where m is the number of machines. You can work out the density just by looking at the derivative. And obviously by symmetry, the expected length of a segment is one over m. So plugging this inside into in here and making the assumption of a very large number of machines, you can see that the probability that the segment is k times as long as the average segment is like e to the minus k. So you can use this fact to then you know, say, well, actually, per machine, we don't only pick one segment, but maybe 10 segments or so. And then you know, concentration starts kicking in, and the average, say, well, basically, the size distribution of those 10 subsegments is much less than you know, what you would have gotten with a single one. And then also, your balancing operation works better. Um, you can do even more beautiful things. So this is called proportional hashing. So there's, for instance, a very nice paper by Chavala et al, Usenix 2011, which describes that in great detail for designing a video caching system. And the idea is essentially very similar to what you would get in a rejection sampler. So you basically allocate, pre-allocate a certain in interval. And then for each machine in your machine pool, you basically predefine a small segment size. And then if, your machine if a key comes along, I go and compute the hash. And OK, well, here I hit something. Then I go and compute another hash. Well, I didn't hit anything, so I need to rehash. I hit something. And I keep on doing this until I get something. So you can easily see this now gives me a proportional load balance distribution. However, you can also see that you know, once you run out of space, you're done for. So you, know, you pick that maybe a factor of 10 or something to make sure that there's enough space for improvement. Now, those of you who have built samplers would immediately see this looks awfully like a rejection sampler, right? You have a proposal distribution, which is uniform over this larger interval. My acceptance is only if I hit those bins. And I think there's actually some very nice statistical combination, well, connections between you know, sampling, load distribution, and machine learning that are worthwhile exploring. Talk to me later if you're interested in that. So a nice application of that are the random caching trees of Akamai, from, of Karga et al. That's, I think, pretty much the paper that started Akamai. And the idea is you build random trees for each uh, key. And then, well, you just, th therefore, you know, are not creating hotspots because, you know, each key is being cached in a different way. So this would be the master, and those next level uh, nodes would only be instantiated whenever you actually have enough requests. And there's a lot more fun stuff to it. OK, so this is what you get, basically. You get essentially that each node does more or less, you know, uniform work. So now that's just the background a little bit to give you a bit of an idea of what's going on. Let me now show you what we use this for. Let's take sketching algorithms. So, well, what you have is a real-time data stream, like for instance queries, and you might want to get a real-time response of aggregate statistics. And I'm going to make the following relaxation, namely it's perfectly okay if I don't quite get the exact answer as long as it's reasonably good. And I want to be able to get aggregate counts, as in I want to be able to ask, you know, how many times did I see a particular query in a particular time range? And unfortunately, of course, the set of queries or whatever other items is not known beforehand. And what I want to make sure is that I have perfect scaling, as in more machines, means I can process more data. They mean I have higher fault tolerance. They mean I have higher accuracy. And I can also pull more requests out of it. And I'll now show you how those very simple ideas, that I, those hashing ideas that I demonstrated before, can be used to extend something like count min sketch immediately to such an algorithm. Why do we care? Well, you know, if I have stuff that's you know, several days old, well, OK, maybe I can use Hadoop or whatever to do offline batch processing. This is for the real-time sketching system. And it makes for a very simple system. So the three tools that we'll need is the count min sketch, which I'm going to explain to you now, then consistent hashing, what we looked at before, 
and then some interpolation tricks in order to look back in terms of the marginals. Okay, so here's the complement sketch. Um, so, who of who in the audience has knows how a Bloom filter works? Cool. Okay. Now think of the Bloom filter with integers rather than bits, and you pretty much have the complement sketch. Now, in okay, so here, here's what you do. You basically take one row per hash function, so that's a little bit different from a Bloom filter, and the insert algorithm works as follows. For a given key, you compute for each row the hash for this key, and you increment the corresponding bin by one. At query time, I go and look at all the bins that I have touched, and I take the minimum over those bins. So why is this a good idea? Well, first of all, and the, the assumption is we only do inserts. There are interesting variations on that theme, but basically for only inserts, we know all those numbers are non-negative. Furthermore, we know that each of those bins got incremented whenever we saw that particular item. So therefore, each of those numbers is going to be an upper bound. Since all of them are going to be an upper bound, I can take the minimum, it's still going to be an upper bound. So this is a very nice algorithm by Kormod and Mutakrishnan, which does this. So the guarantees, and these are, that's a really amazing thing is, I mean, okay, so this part you can see immediately that the count that I get from this is going to be a greater or equal than the actual number of counts. You can also see that this is, and this is a little bit more of a proof, but it's actually a very elementary proof, that it's basically upper bounded by epsilon, where epsilon is basically essentially one over number of bins times the t total number of inserts that I made. Furthermore, if I have a power law distribution, this is actually even better. So this is a very, very nice sketch because it's actually the first, and I'm not sure whether it's so far still the only sketch, that has an order one over number of bins dependency rather than one over squared number of bins. And so essentially the, the way how you prove it is you, okay, the lower bound is trivial for the upper bound. You first prove the expected value, and then you essentially show the probability that you have a certain deviation per hash row, and then you use essentially just, you know, Multi you just boost the probability by multiplying them in order to show a tight bound. So it's a very, very elementary proof, and you will enjoy reading that paper. It's beautiful. So the problem, however, is, well, you know, the accuracy, while it's really great, it's like one over a number of bins, well, at some point I run out of memory, so if I want to have higher accuracy, well, I can't. Furthermore, this works beautifully if I have a single machine where I insert, if I have many machines, well, you know, I first of all need to be able to actually process the data. Secondly, I need reliability. And then finally, this is a fully static sketch. What I want to be able to do is actually get a similar estimate for time series data. Okay, so the second tool we're going to use is now an application of consistent hashing. So, and I'll show you this in about three simple steps. So first of all, how do we increase throughput? Well, that's really easy, right? We have a single machine. Now we have several mach servers. And I just shard my keys over those servers. In other words, I just you know, uniformly distribute the keys over, you know, through this argmin hash. And I could use something different, but argmin is good enough probably for that. Because I might have dozens of servers. Now, this is really good, right? Because, you know, the Accuracy actually goes up like one over number of servers because now each server gets only a smaller fra fraction of the data. And since the accuracy was amount of data inserted over memory locations, my accuracy goes up, subject to, well, small log factors, but I'm ignoring them here. Furthermore, the throughput increases because if I have k servers, I can insert k times as many keys. But I'm really screwed because the reliability decreases. So if I lose one machine, basically my system goes down. How can I fix this? Now let's look at that part. So suppose you know, here we have various hashes, each of them go, all of them go into one machine. Well, there's absolutely no need for that. I could go and in essentially insert one hash per machine. And then the good thing is, you know, I would really have to kill all those machines in order to lose all information about that data. Okay. So in other words, I now go and insert into you know, k servers rather than into a single one, 
and that way I gain a reliability. This is great. The accuracy actually increases because now each machine needs to store less data. The throughput is more or less constant depending on my interprocess communications library. But the problem is that you know the latency actually goes up a lot for queries because I need to wait until all servers have returned the argument. And there is no acceleration. Okay. So that's pretty much the opposite end of what I showed you before in terms of scaling up. Now we increase reliability. Okay. Next step, can we actually increase query throughput? Well, that's fairly straightforward, right? I just over-insert into more servers. Let's say I need four hashes to get a good answer. I insert into maybe eight machines. And if I have a lot more queries than inserts, you know, I just pick a random subset of four machines out of the eight, the eight that have my data, and I'll be fine. And on top of that, I gain reliability. So this is also easy. Now let's just combine the tricks. So the trick is basically you assign keys only to a subset of machines, you over-replicate them for reliability, and you over-replicate them for query parallelism. And there will be a picture on it in a moment. So what you do is, again, you use this consistent set hashing. So now, for each key, there will be another random subset of K machines that are responsible for it. Each of them gets one hash function. Make just sure that you seed it with the machine-specific key. Otherwise, if you have the same hash function on several machines, you get no improvement. It's just if you implement it, it's a, a useful thing to know. And then you request from a smaller subset of those machines, and again, you can use consistent hashing to have a random subset depending on the client. So then you can actually prove a few useful things for it. So the useful bit here is, I mean, uh, I mean, simplifying all of this, essentially, you need about one extra machine to hold your sketch if you have, let's say, 10 failures and at least 20 machines. So the argument goes as follows. You basically can pick, you, you can, well, since hashing randomizes the inserts over the machines, an adversary cannot really screw me in an arbitrarily bad way, because, so therefore I can essentially randomize over the failures. If I assume that they insert into less than half the machines in the machine pool, I can majorize the drawing with, without replacement, because basically if a machine is dead, well, I can't kill it again by something where the machine gets killed over and over. So this upper bounds the number of failures that I can experience. And then it's a very simple three, four line analysis where you just have a, bino just a binomial expansion to get that inequality. So it's more detail in, in the paper that's at the moment under submission. It's a very, very simple analysis. So just to show you the picture of what's going on. So here is our machine pool, and we decide to insert into those four machines. And for a query, I picked a random subset of those three machines <coughs> to get the answer. This scales linearly with the number of servers in terms of accuracy, reliability, and, well, scalability. So this is kind of nice. Now, I haven't told you yet how to fix the temporal aspect. So the time series interpolation essentially works as follows. So the count mid sketch is a linear statistic. That's the key idea. So in other words, if I want to sketch two sets, I just sum the sketches and everything's fine. So if I want to get a sketch over a longer time interval, I take the first sketch and the second sketch and I sum them up. Easy. So the other thing is I can also reduce the bit resolution by essentially folding the sketch over onto itself. And so, and the good thing is I can do that with the process data as opposed to ever having to touch the original data again. So let me first show you the time aggregation. So what we are doing is something actually very straightforward. We pick an exponentially increasing set of intervals. So basically one, two, four, eight, and so on. And so each two to the, each two to the n time steps, I need to compute Okay, so it's not 2n, but 2 to the n, sorry, that went wrong. I need to recompute all the bins up to 2 to the n. <coughs> the trick here is that I have a cumulative sum where I have the ones twice. That makes everything work out nicely, such that now the cumulative sum is basically just powers of 2. In other words, if I want to compute that interval, I just need to sum over all those intervals if they were consecutively aligned. So what I do is I basically let those intervals age 
until they are perfectly aligned. Then I do an aggregation sweep and I get the next interval. I'll show you that in the picture in a moment. Um, the good thing is I only have to write into the first bin. This is the only one that's really going to get all the inserts. Everything else is fine, so I have reasonably memory loca locality. And you can actually show that the aggregation is basically log log t time in terms of the aggregation cost. So it's a non-issue. The good thing is we get logarithmic storage in terms of the time interval that we sketch. So let me show you the intervals. Let's say first we have interval 1. Then, OK, it ages. We write into another interval. Then it ages. Now we, have to, now we basically go sum those two up and get an interval of length 2. And this one gets, this one gets aged. OK, so now these move over. Now we can compute an interval of length 4, and so on and so on. And we can go on. OK, so we have length 1, 2, 4, and 8. However, this is stored in memory in that way, right? We always write here, and these intervals age. The other thing is just basically going from you know, backwards to forwards in time. Now, I can do a similar thing with a bit resolution. So if I have my bit resolution every two to the n steps, you can easily see that, therefore, you know, a length of two to the n will always require the same amount of memory. So that's the first one for the for you know time intervals two and three. I need the same storage for four, five, six, and seven. In aggregate, I need the same storage. Okay. So why did I show you those two techniques? Right. I mean, one in a way gives you a good aggregation over time. The other one gives you an aggregation of items. So we're basically trading off two, two knobs here. We can either reduce the item resolution of our sketch and keep the time resolution accurate. So in the most extreme case, maybe for historical data that's two years old, we will only know that, well, in that particular year, basically how many times the, the, the query machine learning was issued in a particular year. The other extreme is that for, you know, one year ago, exactly around midnight, I had maybe a million queries, right? But I won't know anymore which ones they are. Now, that's effectively, you know, pinning down the marginals of a joint distribution which I would really like to be able to store, but which I can't do because of storage cost. And this is fixed by, at least approximately fixed, by then just taking the product of the marginals, and this is a good estimate. Now, you would immediately say, well, hey, there's some, there are so many smarter algorithms out there. There's like, you know, just any exponential family sketching, uh, you know, estimation algorithm will do better. Sure. But these algorithms require more than order one time in order to get the number. So therefore, we do the really cheap and dirty thing. There's actually an interesting question of what you would do at higher order marginals. Okay. Let me show you very briefly that it works. Okay, some data that we had, it follows a nice power law distribution. And, okay, so here are three sketches that you will see, and it's stratified in an interesting way. So, okay, you can't really see the colors, but basically we compared the sketch which just aggregates over the items, you know, which basically at each two to the end time steps reduces the item resolution one with one that basically just, you know, makes longer and longer intervals and then essentially predicts a piecewise constant function and then something that uses the product. And the green line is the product, and you can see it's doing reasonably well. The other thing that you can see is that as we get more and more data, this blue line, which basically just reduces the bits, does a bit better. And that's not very surprising, because if you have a very heavy hitter, if you look at the original Komod Mutu Krishnan guarantees, you can see that they basically are absolute deviations. And well, I plotted relative ones, so if I have a very heavy hitter, then it doesn't hurt me so much if I have collision with a lot of irrelevant entries. So you could probably do something smart here by switching between those two estimators. Um, the fact that these purple curves have slight peaks here has to do with the fact that this is a non-uniform volume. So of course, if you have a lot of volume, well, the error will also go up, especially if I estimate something as piecewise constant. Similar figures I can show you for different error measures and things behave qualitatively the same. This is probably quite interesting. Here's the number of read requests and on the next slide the number of insert requests. 
over now between well basically one and ten servers obviously if I have if I want to read from at least three machines I need to start here and for five machines I need to start here but what you can see is it's basically linear scaling so this is as, as good as it gets it's a similar thing here um, you can use the same tricks for other sketches so you have for instance a space saving sketch in that case well okay I can't really go into much detail how it works but basically you, you use the very same machinery okay we're going to skip peer to peer and I'm quickly going to show you more or less the same picture here so for distributing random variables in an inference procedure again you have essentially a tree well you basically need to build a replica tree and that replica tree is instantiated through a tree which respects you know the layout that you have within your cluster within a rack you want to be as flat as possible because you sit on a switch you have perfect you know communication between the racks well you probably want to use the uh, well take well basically respect the fact that you know your between rack bandwidth is a lot lower than the within rack bandwidth and okay I can talk about synchronization distribution fault tolerance Joey told me anyway that my time's up here's a, a very very brief thing that you sometimes may want to worry about namely suppose I have you know k machines that need to talk to another set of k machines and suppose that the messages that each of those machines have is like you know one over number of machines so basically the more machines I have the smaller the smaller packets each machine needs to tell to another one so if I then just naively let them all talk to everybody at the same time I will get a very low data rate between any pair this is really bad because basically my switch and my entire TCP IP stack will create big overheads so one way to fix this is to actually you know schedule who talks to whom in a specific order now if I were to you, you could always think okay let's just pick a nice you know synchronous order but that's not a good idea because as soon as a single machine is delayed all the delays pile up and bad things happen so what you can do instead is you just essentially sample with replacement um, by picking a random schedule for each machine now if you do that and I just pick you know one machine at a time I create two problems one is some machines will be entirely left out so that's exactly the one over E that you also know from the bootstrap and what's at least as bad some machines will be hotspots because they will actually receive inserts from more than one machine now there's a very easy fix to it well you pick more than one but maybe two turns out four is a good number and there's a little inequality that I'll show you on the next slide and so for instance with two connections you can already see that the efficiency of this communication scheme is between 0.78 and 0.89 okay so how do I get those numbers well these are basically nine machines well this machine is left out so I definitely can only get eight ninth of the efficiency to get that lower bound you basically say well each local machine spreads its uh, network bandwidth evenly between all the links and then I just add up whatever I get here if I have you know let's say three edges coming in I just throw one of them away and that gets you the lower bound in practice it's somewhere in between that's just for this specific random graph in general you can get this inequality in the, num in the limit of large number of machines and essentially four simultaneous connections are enough if you do that that's what you get and I think now I've really overstayed my time so it's just well two billion documents not million billion on a thousand machines and that's basically a essentially you know Gibbs sampler procedure to well do some user profiling so the last slide and this is essentially what you could almost use as a somewhat of a research agenda is take your algorithm ask what happens what guarantees can I get if some of the machines die furthermore I want to have linear scaling as I throw more hardware at the problem the third issue is well I actually have communication constraints because well I have non-uniform connectivity structure within my server centers and I want to keep parameters local and this gives me a lot of really fun questions one corollary if you design the algorithms 
try to avoid having a master. Because masters are single points of failure, and you have to work hard to make them go away. OK, that's all I want to say. It seems like there should be some connection between the problems you're solving here and the stuff that people have done in uh, measuring the size of flows, like in a, like in a, with a, in a network. Great. Um, so it, it's, it's actually a flow problem. It's just that it's, it's a very simple flow, flow problem. And um, well, we did the very, uh, we, we did the very small analysis of just checking that actually, you know, your flow is reasonably well controlled. So basically, 80% uh, was good enough for us because everything beyond that is just you know lost in your network stack anyway. Uh, but yes, there's also connections to, to random codes and so on. Yes? How is this happening? Is that people Yes. So. Uh, as a matter of fact, you will find I get okay. <laughs> you will You will find a lot of the same ideas of consistent hashing and distribution also on um, for instance the diamond paper. The diamond paper has to worry about a few other things such as versioning and so on, which we have to worry about before when we have a well latency uh, on protocol, uh, maybe I didn't have version rights and so on, but that's essentially a small instance of what you would get, um, you know, just with distributed QIs. But the difference is we have lower durability requirements, um, at least, you know, for, for these scenarios than what you would get maybe in London. But you could use a lot of those tricks. So, for instance, if you want to make sure that even during network partitions, your rights still work, you could essentially take Dynamo, modify it, and turn it into a sketching service. And that would probably actually work fairly well. OK. Thanks. I mean, thanks for the point. I mean, I'll definitely look it up. I mean, a lot of really cool things in sketching have happened recently, uh, as in maybe the past five years, five to 10 years. So. Uh, it may be a good idea to revisit some of those old ideas and just, you know, update them uh, with some of the data sketches. Let's take out some more time. <coughs>